Well, I think that what we do is very impulsive, especially what we do on stage. You know, it's uh, things happen that are based on uh, just that particular moment. The our show is a combination of pieces that we have rehearsed, which include blank spots during which anything can happen, and the things that happen are based on what what happened to you that day when you woke up, or what happened on your way to the show, or what the audience is doing, or or something like that. So. Uh, the whole environment that I live in is part of the impulse that creates the music. Well, did your schooling have, a, have any effect on your way of thinking or musical thinking? Uh, yes, my schooling had a great effect on my musical thinking. Positive, negative? <laughs> It was all negative. <laughs> well, you were very avant-garde, at least the American way, when you performed your bicycle concerto. Do you consider yourself avant-garde now? Do I consider my... Yes, I'm very avant-garde right now. I am about as avant-garde as I have ever been, right at this very moment. Jazz has had bad experiences when connected with classical music. So has rock in recent years. How is the relationship between Zappa and classics? Uh, you tell me about the classic and I'll tell you about my relationship. What particular classic do you mean? Well, I mean... Uh, Just a combination of rock and serious writing? Yeah, serious writing is the, the word. The basic problem of combining rock music with serious writing is whenever it's been done, it's been done for a sensational exploitation type situation, uh, a special concert perhaps, where uh, I, I have been involved in one thing with the Los Angeles Philharmonic where they used the rock group to bring an audience to the orchestra which was having trouble getting an audience oh. and uh, what usually happens is the orchestra does not play with the same intensity emotional intensity as the rock group that is there and so the the performance never really comes off and then you have acoustical problems of balancing the volume of the electric group against the uh, acoustic group and so forth is that too technical No, no, <coughs> not at all. You seem to, seem to be the only rock personality interested in modernist. Uh, I mean, like uh, Varese and uh, Stanis, uh, Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. you, and, um, how do you see and what do you think of their elements? How can you use them? Well, see, I'm not the only person who might be interested in Stravinsky. There are probably some others in rock now who are interested in, in that kind of music, but I believe I was the first one to bring those composers to the attention of a, a young record-buying public. And the thing that uh, I enjoy about those composers is the harmonic language is, is a lot more interesting than uh, the normal harmonic language that is used in pop music. Like, uh, you know how rock and roll is constructed? You get a guy with a guitar, see, and he knows if he's starting, He knows one, two, or maybe three chords. If he's been playing for a few years, he knows 10, 20, maybe 30 chords. The chords themselves are not interesting because, you know, they're standard positions that you put your hand in on the guitar. See, so when songs are made up out of standard things like that, they will tend to sound repetitive, you know, they'll always be the same. So if you're writing for a group of instruments, and each person in that group gets to play one note of a chord that gives you the chance to make the chord any density that you like you know it can be like this it can be like that it can be spread out like that and uh, you can only do that by working with uh, many instruments and uh, different tone colors and so that's what I've uh, come to appreciate in especially in the writing of Barres is the uh, tone colors and the voicings of the chords. How did you find the first mothers? They were working in a bar, a beer bar called the uh, Broadside in Pomona, California. Did they play anything? Did they play anything? Yes, I mean instruments. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, they were, they were playing instruments at the time, see. Uh, I got a phone call from Ray Collins, who is the lead singer from this group. Now, I had worked with Ray several times on records in 63. 
and he was working in this band at this bar, and they had a guitar player, and Ray and the guitar player had a fist fight, and he beat the guitar player up, and they didn't have a guitar player, so they called me and asked me to come down and substitute. So I went down there, and I said I would look at the band and see if I wanted to play with it, and I thought they were okay. It was Ray Collins on vocals and harmonica, Roy Estrada on bass, Jimmy Carl Black on drums, and a guy named Davey Coronado on tenor sax. And Davey was pretty much leading the band. See. So I got in there and I said, well, you know, we'll never get anywhere working in this beer bar. Let's learn some original material and go make records. And Davey Coronado said, no, if you play original material, you'll get fired from these beer joints, you know, because in those places they only want you to play what's on the radio. So uh, I talked them into playing some original stuff and Davey quit. And he's still working in a beer joint someplace in, in California. And then we got fired, because Davey was right. You know? <laughs> and we kept getting fired for about a year until we finally made a record. Mm. You had some difficulties with the name of the band. Yeah, because uh, the record company that finally signed us uh, didn't want to sign a contract with a group called The Mothers. Why? Because... Uh, Do you want the real reason, or you want a television reason? No, not well, real reason. In the United States, uh, the term mother is short for motherfucker. And the term motherfucker can be used a variety of ways. One way, it means somebody who stuffs it up their mother. And another way, it means a musician who is supposedly good on his instrument. And at the time, in the place where we were working, all the guys who were in the group were the best available in Pomona. Does that give you a rough idea of how sad it was in Pomona in those days? So I thought we should call the group the Mothers, which is, you know, as I explained, short for that other word. So the record company said, no, you'll never be able to sell any records like that. And uh, they said, if you don't change the name of the group, we're not going to give you a contract. And they wanted to call it the Mothers Auxiliary, which is a name that is usually attached to parent organizations in, mm -hmm. in the States. So uh, I said, no, out of necessity, we will become the mothers of invention. Plato. That's right. And that's where it came from. Were mothers the only bands that uh, started uh, to, um, to put political and social comments as a part of the stage act and music? And we were the first one to do it, first group to do it. There were other groups who did it, and they did it for the wrong reasons, I think. The Jefferson Airplane did it to make money. And the MC5 did it to be sensational. And you were? We just did it because, as a matter of fact, most of the rest of the guys in the group didn't want to do it. I was, uh, I had many arguments with Ray Collins, who was the lead singer of the group, about the lyrics to the songs. He didn't want to say those things, you know. Does Zappa music sell better now than five or six years ago? Uh, it sells faster. I think our biggest selling record, two biggest selling records, are Freak Out and Hot Rats. Freak Out because it's been available for almost 10 years, and Hot Rats because it sells steadily month after month and has uh, sold um, a large quantity of records over a long period of time. With the last two LPs uh, sold fast but did not sell as much as the others. Do you think that the public has grown up to understand your music better than? Well, I should think that after 10 years that they would get used to it a little bit more. You know, I don't know whether they understand it better, but it's not so shocking to them to see some of the things that we do.